Hi, this is John Allen, the editor of Crux, and welcome to another installment of our video interview series with movers and shakers on the religious landscape. This particular conversation is brought to you by the good people at Paraclete Press, who are the publishers uh, of the book uh, whose author we're going to be talking with here today. Ladies and gentlemen, it, you know, we have interviewed people all over the religious landscape here on Crux. We've spoken to cardinals, we've spoken to imams, we've spoken to uh, movers and shakers of all sorts, but it is not often we have the opportunity to bring you a real honest-to-God living legend. Uh, but that's what we have uh, for you here today. Uh, we are going to be speaking with one of America's premier, if not the premier, scholars of religion, most of his career at the University of Chicago, uh, one of the most respected uh, writers and speakers uh, from a Lutheran perspective in the English language, uh, a longtime stalwart and veteran of ecumenical efforts of all sorts, and if you want to know anything about religion at all, just an absolutely indispensable figure. We, we are joined by Dr. Martin Marty. Uh, Dr. Marty, thank you so much for being with us here today. Glad to be with you. Um, now, folks, uh, Paraclete Press recently brought out uh, a new book by Dr. Marty. Unfortunately, I don't have the hardcover edition of it to show you, but I promise you I've got it on my Kindle. Okay, here here it is. Uh, you can see it. I have uh, it. And, and I just consumed it in one breath uh, when I got it. Uh, it's titled October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther and the Day that Changed the World. And, of course, it's a reference to the fact uh, that we are currently marking the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. So, uh, Dr. Marty, to begin, uh, what prompted you to write this book? And, and give us the Reader's Digest version. 500 years later, what do you believe the legacy of the Protestant Reformation initiated by Martin Luther actually is? What prompted me to write the book, of course, is that the Paraclete Press asked for it, and I trust them. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I took the role that way, too. I, But I was primed because uh, this year... Lutherans and many other Protestants uh, are spending a great deal of energy on the year 1517 and Martin Luther. And I had written a biography of Martin Luther earlier and uh, many, many of my writings. I'm essentially an historian of American religion, but uh, we're not easily confined. Everything connects to everything. Um, what's at heart? What's at issue? Uh, Europe was tinder, it was ready to go uh, aflame, and uh, Martin Luther, a friar, an Augustinian friar, uh, left his monastery and uh, either posted by, by mail to the Archbishop of Mainz or posted to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Saxony, southern Germany, 95 theses that he wanted to, de to debate, and he hit exactly the point that was at issue in the hearts of so many people. Uh, they were all Catholic, and it hit their heart because they were struggling with the same thing he was, and uh, he, basing it essentially on the writings of Paul the Apostle, argued that uh, the Bible taught something different than what had developed in the teaching of penance in the Roman Catholic Church. And in essence, uh, you, in the book, of course, you know, you begin, and uh, Luther had 95 theses, but you begin with number one, because in many ways you describe it as sort of the, the beating heart uh, of, of what he was about and what would become the Protestant Reformation. Uh, describe to us that first thesis and, and why it is so central. All right. The first thesis says, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he meant that the whole Christian life should be one of repentance. Um, my special twist on this is that I always thought that repenting meant grimness, gloom, sourness, sadness, because that's part of what's called for. But um, when you go deeper into it, what the theses are about, it's liberating, it's uh, rejoicing. Uh, and uh, I picked up from Max Scheler, a great uh, scholar admired by Pope John Paul II, that the best way to think of the word repent is not sorrow for sin, but, quote, change of heart. Change of heart. 
The Greek word means to turn, it, turn it around all the way. And I think that's what he was after, and that's what people were looking for. And they didn't want to pay for being right with God. They wanted it free, and he calls it grace. And, and of course, when you talk about paying for being right to God, that's a reference to the system of indulgences that had grown up in the Catholic Church. Can you briefly explain what those were and what Luther's objection to them was? Well, uh, the indulgence system was related to the long drawn out notion that uh, if I want something for God, I have to bring something to God. And uh, I will never have enough to bring, and therefore I can draw on the greatness of the saints who piled up extra virtues. And these were bartered by the church. And you would go confess to the priest, and then he would say, now, pay so and so much or do so and so much. What bothered Luther and many people in Europe at the time was that that system had come down to a legal transaction. Rome wanted to build St. Peter's Church. Uh, the money was up in Germany and Switzerland and up elsewhere. Uh, Italy was rather depleted at the time. So in town after town, somebody would come along to sell these things. As far as Luther was concerned, that profaned the whole concept of having a change of heart. Now, you mentioned, of course, that, that probably the most famous preacher and, and, if you like, salesman for indulgence was a Dominican friar by the name of Jonathan Tetzel. Now, one thing you don't mention in the book, uh, I had once heard uh, that Jonathan Tetzel actually invented history's first advertising jingle. The, the English translation of which was, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Do, do you know if that's actually true? It's so embedded that it, there's no way you can get behind it anymore. But uh, it is so typical of him and what the issue is about. And it is an amazing advertising jingle. Who would resist if you know that you need a coin and you toss it in and the soul springs from purgatory, it was a genius act. But it took a powerful counterforce for people to get liberated from it. Now, uh, when, you, when you talk about what this uh, 500 anniversary of the Reformation is, is all about, you use the images of both heart and soul. And you talk about repentance being the heart of, of Luther's uh, theology and of the Protestant instinct. But you also talk about soul on the Catholic side. Uh, and, and you suggest, in effect, that there has sort of been a change in the Catholic soul. That, you know, what was once this intense and, and fierce confessional rivalry, uh, you know, on, on the Catholic side, there has been, particularly since the Second Vatican Council in the mid-1960s, there has been a much greater openness to, to to coming closer to our Protestant brothers and sisters. I mean, for one thing, we don't call you heretics anymore. You know, we, we call you, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters. Uh, and there has been all kinds, there has been all kinds uh, of progress uh, in relations between the two sides. Can can you just talk about that uh, a little bit? It maybe say something in particular. Uh, about the Joint Declaration on Justification, which which was such a milestone in all this. The change began to come with uh, Pope John XXIII and the Second Vatican Council and the uh, explosion of interest in Catholicism in scriptural studies. Uh, Protestants have always taught that the Bible was chained so nobody could steal it. Um, it was chained because it was so rare. The printing had just been invented, and the uh, Bible was kind of a rare thing. But Catholics were hungry, too, and they started reading it. Uh, Luther was not alone in this. He was dependent upon, we call them humanists, people who learned the ancient Greek and long-time Latin, and he it opened whole new things. That went on in Catholicism and is going on into our time. Uh, when uh, I'm a... I'm a part-time preacher. And when I would preach on Romans, I would turn first to commentary on Romans by Raymond Brown, a Jesuit, which is one of the best of the commentaries. And uh, any important gathering now, Society of Biblical Literature or anything like that, uh, it sounds funny to say, you can hardly tell the Protestants from the Catholics because they're converging on this theme in a new way. There's some people who say, uh, won't mean anything unless Catholics take everything back. Nobody takes everything back. 
we are who we are. But looking into the future, they there are no barriers at all. And a document uh, several years old now uh, is taught in all the seminaries and uh, enhanced every time you have a committee meeting. What I like, I, I went to an ecumenical gathering once where the World Council of Churches was trying to define what is the nature of the unity we seek. And the uh, bureaucratic typist from Geneva sent it to us in the press room that the goal of the Christian unity is that all in each place who are baptized in Jesus Christ should come to a full committee fellowship. That was the mistake. The real word was it should come to a fully committed fellowship. And today's Catholic leadership and Lutheran and Protestant leadership is committed toward finding ways to realize ever more toward that fully committed fellowship. Just as a footnote, Dr. Marty, I, I think Raymond Brown was actually a Sulpician, not a Jesuit. I'm, I'm sure the Jesuits would love to claim him, uh, but this is one case in which I don't think they can. Um, can you just say a brief word about the, the joint statement on the doctrine of justification and its importance? All right. Uh, Martin Marty, the non-Sulpician, answers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, that there was a joint statement. This is a 20, 30 year process of regular meetings, always opening to the Bible and the whole history of the church. And uh, justification by faith is, in a sense, a code word uh, for the whole idea of the free grace of God. Um, it really goes back to the legal notion that God is a scorekeeper, and uh, it's like we justify our bank account, He's justifying us, and He's done it not by our works, but by uh, the gift of faith. And uh, Catholic biblical scholars all came to the same notion that that's it. And uh, the joint statement makes that very clear. It's not something that leads you to say, ah, we, we Lutherans won. That would be really contrary to the whole thing, is that we came together and all future moves there my book discusses some of the problems still ahead for the fully committed fellowship but they'll always be guided by joint study of the scripture in relation to the history of the church and finally dr marty before we let you go uh, as part of that growing in closeness uh, and also part of the uh, observations uh, of the anniversary uh, last October, as you well know, uh, on October 31st, which of course is the actual day of the anniversary, uh, Pope Francis traveled to Sweden uh, to meet the head of the Lutheran World Federation to engage in some ecumenical liturgies together and so on. How do you see the significance of that trip? For one thing, it's interesting that he chose Sweden, which is the nation with the second most number of Lutherans in the world, Germany, Sweden, guest number three, Tanzania. Guess number four, Ethiopia. Lutheranism has moved south. And just like Western Europe and North America are languishing spiritually in some ways, uh, the southern world is dynamic. So you want to celebrate that, you go to a historic place. And uh, what I think was interesting is the way he tweaked this, or they tweaked this, is that he held a joint service, and uh, the Archbishop of Sweden and the Pope are holding it together, and the Archbishop of Sweden is a, a woman. That's just un, unimaginable a few years ago and hardly remarked upon now that Lutherans and Catholics were getting together in that thing was the big deal, that the Pope and the Archbishop are the big deal. Oh yeah, and by the way, she was a, a woman. <laughs> So changes well, all of which just proves we are in a very different space than we used to be, right? Indeed, and we're thankful to all the people, including October 31st, 1517, and all the Jesuits and the Sulpicians and everybody else who are helping us uh, understand it now. Well, we have been speaking to Dr. Martin Marty. He is the author of October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther and the Day that Changed the World, published by Paraclete Press. So at some point uh, during this remarkable year, observing the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, you owe it to yourself to get that book and to read it. It is an absolutely gripping read. Dr. Marty, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. You have been watching <clears throat> part of our series of inter video interviews with movers and shakers on the religious landscape here at Crux. I'm John Allen, the editor of Crux. 
We will talk to you again soon. Until then, have a great day.